welcome to this episode of Collider Mailbag. This is the show where we answer your viewer submitted questions. How do you do that? You send in uh, not to just gmail.com, but to collidervideo <laughs> at gmail.com. And we'll take a few and answer them either on this show or on our daily movie talk show. This is also the show where we try not to talk about how hungry we are. <laughs> Joining us today, we have Sinead DeFries. How are you doing? Good, thanks. I'm not starving just yet, but I'm sure by the end of this show, I will be there. Uh-huh. Happy to be here. Perry, what about you? Are you, are you starving yet? I was actually talking to Sinead about this. I was thinking about it and I was perfectly fine. And then I sat at this desk and I'm like, hmm, you know, I'm kind of thinking about lunch right now. How many <laughs> tweets did we all get last so Saturday about many. our Collider food talk slash so many. what food we sn- sneak in into movie I theaters. got so many um, offers to go on like donut hole dates, movie dates, dates. <laughs> we were like i'll bring you donut holes and i was like this is awesome because it just made me so happy <laughs> now i'm hungry yes <laughs> all right let's start off with our first non-food question all right jordan writes greetings from the uk i can't wait for kubo and the two strings to come out in cinemas here not until september unfortunately but i was disappointed to hear that it performed poorly in its opening weekend in the u.s do you think that Leica will close down if this film doesn't manage to make its money back? With Studio Ghibli also closing down, I think this is adding to the lack of original ideas in film and alternative styles of animation. It looks to me like animation is just going towards more CGI live action adaptations of classic Disney films. What do you guys think the future of animation is going to involve? Thanks for taking my question. Hope you all have a great day. Yeah, I also was disappointed at the box office for Kubo because I really liked that movie. I ranted about it on this past Monday's movie talk about people complaining about, oh, there's no original films or unique ideas and everything's a rehash, a sequel, a remake, blah, 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 blah. And then this movie comes out and does, I think, like a uh, worst performing movie, worst opening weekend. And I think it's one of their best films. Do I think they're going to close? I don't think so. Um, Travis Knight, who runs the studio, um, comes from a very wealthy background. Mm -hmm. And I think as long as the studio doesn't lose money, I think it it will do fine. Uh, Perry, you interviewed Travis when he came in studio. I did. I actually specifically asked about the box office. It wasn't a straightforward answer, like an answer you would want to this question, but... He definitely didn't seem especially concerned. He had talked more about the idea of their company being more about funding original ideas than worrying about competing with a Disney animation or a Pixar. But regardless, that number is pretty damn low. The movie only made $12.6 million. That is its lowest opening weekend. And makes me a little nervous. I don't I don't think that Leica is going to close anytime soon, but this is the reason we have problems with getting more sequels, reboots, remakes, etc. than we do original material and you know, it it's no one's fault. It's only natural for a movie based on a previous previously existing property or that's part of a franchise to make more money. And and it's the same thing when you're looking at Leica versus let's say Disney Animation or Pixar it's just natural for more people in the general population to seek out a Disney movie versus a Leica movie, especially when, you know, I'm thinking about Illumination Entertainment. Mm-hmm. They're kind of a newer company, that, and they're carving out a place for themselves. But if you look at their material, it's got a much broader appeal than, let's say, a Leica movie. So when you factor in all those things, something like this is inevitable to a degree unless let's say for some reason there was some huge explosion with kubo where everyone was freaking out and it just caught on like wildfire but you know that's a situation where it's kind of a a shot in the dark you know like a paranormal activity in the horror franchise realm if something just catches on fire like that maybe you can defy the odds but it's it's hard not to be nervous for Leica and for the sake of original animation because i love the movie and i wanted it to do better uh, Sinead, what do you think about this? I mean, I agree with what you said. It is actually really frustrating when all you hear is complaints about original films um, not being more relevant in today's like movie pop culture and what we're all interested in. And then something great comes out and it doesn't get the amount of exposure that it truly deserves. But I would say that the only thing at this point is like you guys have a way of like spreading 
the word about good movies and if if you think a movie is really really something special then urge your friends to see it like absolutely like do whatever you can to take your friends or your boyfriends or your girlfriends or your parents or your siblings to see good movies because it would be a damn shame if 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 this movie caused the studio to lose money which i mean i don't think is going to happen at all and especially once it does debut um uh, internationally as well I think it'll do better internationally because word of mouth already I've heard nothing but incredible things from everybody else as well so that gives me hope that at least th as much as people talk about it that internationally it's going to have bigger openings because people are getting excited about what they have heard about the mm -hmm. movie but if you like a movie and it's original film and that's something that you believe in and something you believe we should see more of then absolutely spread the word about it because it's important that that we support these studios that have original content because original content is important because there is going to be one day where we're going to be sick of franchises i do believe it so like let's support the original content while we're getting good original content i have a question for for both of you do you think that okay because this is a stop motion film mm -hmm. animated film do you think if you took the same story with the same characters and the same look and made it let's say a 3d animated film that this movie would have performed better because I love the stop motion right. animation. I think it looks fantastic. Yep. I love the look of it. I love the feel of it, but it is a lot of hard work. Uh -huh. It's very painstaking. And it's also something that does, just doesn't have that wide appeal. Do it's not the mainstream animation. And I absolutely think it would have done better if it was a a 3D animated movie. I, I don't think the stop motion animation thing appeals to a lot of people. I don't know what it is about it. I loved it. Like Coraline, I loved Coraline. And I at that time wasn't hearing very good things about that either and people kept saying it looks weird it hmm. looks weird i'm like but this is the style, style yeah. this is an actual animation thing they didn't just like mess up but, like yeah. they're not trying something new this is stop motion animation this is what it always looks like this is what stop motion animation looks like and people don't get it no. i think if you're comparing looks like because when you asked the question you said look i mean the look of cg animation can vary as well so if they had gone you know hyper detailed mm. like we get in stop motion animation then i don't think it would have increased the appeal at all but thinking of my little cousins i think if these characters were designed the same way let's say the secret life of pets characters yeah. were those kids might have been looking at this right. movie and thinking, oh, I want to see it. Whereas at this point, I haven't spoken to, to them about Kubo, but I imagine that they have seen these trailers and are not all that interested. Yeah. I mean, uh, it, it's so sad because I appreciate the, the passion that Travis Knight has mm -hmm. for his studio and for this type of animation. And you can tell that this is made out of love. And, right. and, and I, I wish... There was a better response from the well that's the coolest thing about Leica is he also said during that interview which i found very very interesting that they don't test screen their movies and you could look at it which i think he even pointed out himself as that being something where they're essentially shooting themselves in the foot because they don't know what a you know a not necessarily a general audience but that small audience that is there for the test screening purposes thinks but at the same time, they do that because they respect the writer and director's original visions and yeah. what they want the story to be, not necessarily what they want the story to be so to make money. But I don't think they're shooting themselves in the foot because the films are received both critically and by the people who actually see them very well. It's yeah. not like they're watching, oh, these are terrible. I they think know they've got a good thing. Yeah. Well, it's, but it's like if they had filled that test screening audience with a bunch of, you know, five to ten year olds and the kids right. came out and be like, oh, Kuba looks funny, you know, that kind of way. Yeah. All right. Let's move on to the next question. Brian writes, hey, everyone, I watch movie talk every day. You guys are such a huge part of my leaf. Anyway, so it's almost September. We still haven't seen more than one production still of Silence, a movie that wrapped in May of 2015. Paramount already has an Oscar movie in Fences, which we've also seen nothing from, but it has a locked release date in Festival Bow Bo Bow at Bow. the New York Film Festival. As days get closer to September, will Paramount finance two big money Oscar campaigns, or will Silence open in 2017? What is a Festival Bow at? What does that mean? Just the premiere. Oh, oh, okay. Uh, Perry? 
I was actually talking about this topic with Adam Chitwood, who, if you guys haven't seen, he does the Oscar beat column on Collider.com. And if you're interested in the Oscar race at all, I highly recommend checking that out because he follows it from this beginning point when movies are coming out or we're hearing that they're coming out all the way through to actual predictions for the award shows. And it's great. But we were talking about it, and at this point, I think it's that silence isn't finished yet. I think it still might be on the table for a release for award season this year. But in terms of Paramount splitting the funding for different movies, I mean, studios fund Oscar campaigns for various movies every year. There's always multiple movies that could be in the race, and you know what happens as the award season progresses and as movies premiere. Maybe they think something's going to be the hot ticket, and then all of a sudden they realize, oh, it's not, and as we get closer to, let's say, the Oscars, they start to figure out, oh, this movie has a better shot at the best picture one, whereas this one has a better shot at uh, best visual effects. And they'll start spending their money in different areas depending on what best suits the movie. Adam had given me a couple of of good examples too. He, He brought up 2013, Warner Brothers had Her and Gravity, and Gravity was clearly a huge front runner in a whole bunch of categories, whereas Her had best original screenplay as a really good opportunity to snag an Oscar so as they divvied up the funds in that respect but I'm I'm just curious I'm curious to see both fences and silence obviously I, I really want I hope that they lock that at some point and we do find out when it's going to premiere because I am dying to see that movie well with silence it's like they it was supposed to come out last year I remember mm-hmm. because uh, I had done like a most anticipated movies of of 2015 and silence was on that list obviously got pushed back i think we we have seen i think one production still uh with andrew garfield in there but i i do think hopefully we'll get a teaser trailer soon they might do like a limited release in like december and that way they can still put it up for oscar consideration then do a wide release in 2017 i the thing is is about these oscar campaigns people have to remember too not that that they have to like a a set pool of money like okay we can only spend this on this oscar campaign this oscar campaign oscar campaigns are an investment in their movie because they want these films to garner these nominations and hopefully these awards because it actually helps the bottom line of the movie that means more people are willing to go see it if a movie wins best picture they're going to get more people into the theater so i think I, I'm not so worried about the, the Oscar campaign in terms of, of them not pushing any money towards it. I'm just more concerned about if the movie's actually going to come out. I hear you. Because we haven't, we haven't seen a trailer for and it. And Paramount doesn't just have those two potential ones. They also have Arrival and Allied. So, you know, maybe they're even considering not just Oscars in terms of, you know, if if silence is finished in time to be in contention for this year's oscar season maybe they're also thinking about you know their release slate and those those two movies are coming out in in uh, november fences is mid-december maybe they're positioning it so it has a limited release in december and then they could focus on that for the beginning of january just for the sake of spreading spreading the love a little All right, what's next? Gee Mama writes, hello, Collider crew. After hearing what Ben-Hur costs to make versus what it's raked in on its opening weekend, by the way, I don't even remember seeing the movie advertised, I have a question. How do movie budgets work? Who decides on a number and how? Who decides on how the budget is spent? Do the studios decide on the actors, director, and crew before setting an amount for the budget, or is the amount set and the director does what he or she must Oops, turns out that I have more than one question. <laughs> Love you guys. Um, for for a lot of films, if the studio already has in mind that they're making this movie, they'll have a budget range in mind that they're willing to spend for it. And then when the directors and producers come on board, then they formulate the budget based on the script. They go through the script and find out, okay, if we're going to get this actor, the, these sets, these locations, because because they've already done this work before they kind of can estimate how much it is but but a lot but some for the smaller films though I I feel like the directors and producers like for indie films they 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 kind of have to come up with the budget 
straight off and then present it and sell it to studios and they green light it or not. Perry? Yeah, I imagine this process probably changes from film to film to a point unless there's a studio out there and we know there are many with a specific model and a specific right. type of film that tends to deliver every single time and then they just repeat it every time over. But I, I just imagine that it's a combination of, you know, studio execs and producers making these types of decisions and you've got to factor in how in terms of how you're going to spend that money what is going to get you the most back so you know if you're in a situation where you're moving forward with a film and you get a particular actor that you didn't expect obviously more money is going to go to that if that actor is going to bring in more money when the film actually comes out so i think it's kind of an ever-changing process but on the independent level, I've only had experience with the one movie that I made, and that is just a matter of that. That process was a fluid money money spending process from the day we decided to make it to the day we finished it, and it didn't it didn't stop changing the entire time. Start with the script, you go through the whole thing, and you basically just like highlight or flag every single thing that could possibly cost you money in any respect whatsoever, yeah. and then as you're shooting the film obviously things change and you realize you need to be spending more money on one thing versus another and it could be for so many different reasons like you lose a location a certain shot that you think you could get that all of a sudden you can't get and then you have to redesign a set there there's just so many things that could come up on an on the independent level that could change the budget in a flash that that really is the most horrifying thing about making an independent film is that mm -hmm. You know, you think you got your budget set and then all of a sudden you could spend a significant amount of money on a single day that you didn't expect. Well, I think that's the thing with independent film. It, it's it's almost like you kind of set that budget at an unrealistic uh, number because you you so want to believe that you could make the money for X. Yeah. But really... You always end up needing more yes, money. Yes, you always will need more money. Where I think with the, a lot of the studio films, they've already done it so many times. They right. know exactly how much things are going to cost and how long it's it's really like the shooting days how many days that they, they need they need the crew locations wardrobe props everything right. how much the visual effects are going to mm -hmm. cost studios can have things blow up in their face too I yes mean, well wasn't there talk like before michael keaton was confirmed for um spider-man wasn't there talk between the fact that they couldn't afford both um uh, RDJ and Michael Keaton wasn't there wasn't that like the rumor before before they said Michael Keaton was 100% I heard that one of the biggest things why they took a while to confirm mm. Michael Keaton why there was a lot of back and forth is because because of the budget because they couldn't afford both every of uh, both of them at the time but they they worked it out because it's a big studio and obviously they have the money to do that and it's possible i mean that that goes back to that story of iron man 2 of uh terrence howard uh so they need to pay uh robert downey jr more money for the second one because they didn't pay him very much for the first right. one and so they asked terrence howard to take less money right and then that ended up being like his exit and then don Cheadle coming right. in so even a huge production like that still has a budget that they hmm. tried to respect as yes, well. yes and marvel out of a lot of the different studios is very they're very tight when it comes yeah. to that that's kind of a good bad thing where it's like they they that's why you get these kind of up-and-coming directors at marvel because they know that okay we don't have to pay them that much right money. right so well on the bright side having a small budget also forces you to be more creative with what you have mm -hmm. and can often produce better quality results because you only have you know x y and z to work with rather than saying you know i'm supposed to work with this but i know they've got that so right. maybe i could push for more yeah but also as a as a director or producer you don't want to go over budget because then you start to get a reputation and then studios don't want to you know what i mean yeah. they, they don't want to work with you and oh, you want to make your money back, exactly. right? <laughs> like you spend a crap ton of money in a movie. Um, you're probably not going to make all that money back. Yeah, I mean, that's one thing, you know, I, I always bash the Transformers movies and, and, and Michael Bay. That's one thing. He comes on budget and he does his. He always, yeah, always he, makes He money. makes profit for the, hmm. the studio, comes on budget, works really hard. Like right. he does all the right things, you know, right. for the studio. Totally. And that's why they have a. That's street. probably why they let him make fifty-four yes. of and them. And that's why there's a Michael Bay Street on, yeah, at the Paramount. Mall. 
<laughs> All right, what's next? Joe from New Mexico writes, How's it going, Clyder folks? I have a question that I'd like to hear your take on. I remember a while back hearing that the script for The Shallows was highly praised and was a script that the studio had been holding on to for a while. Well, I saw that movie, and I do not understand how that script could have been so praised. The story seemed pretty basic to me. I've heard the situation happening with other movies. Do you think that some stories perhaps are only good when read, opposed to watched on the big screen? Could that movie have been great if simply cast and shot differently, or was it doomed from the start? Love all of the shows on Collider. I'm a big fan. So I haven't seen The Shallows, and nor did I read the script, but so I'll answer this from a more general perspective. When you watch a movie, any movie, it, if if you had heard the script was good and let's say you didn't like the movie, that doesn't mean the script wasn't good. It just means that it's possible that the execution of that script didn't turn out the way it was supposed to be. It, it's just, there's, there's a big difference between what's on the page and what the movie is. I mean, I'm sure there's tons and tons of scripts out there that are remarkable, but maybe sometimes people can't, feel like they can't execute it into a proper movie or or maybe uh just there's certain things about it that that just don't translate well to to a film perry what do you think in regards to the shallows okay. i respectfully disagree i i liked the movie and you know i don't know if this is what the viewer meant but criticizing it for being a basic story mm -hmm. i guess isn't all that i actually appreciated how simple and straightforward that movie was i mean it was it basically was what it was in the promotional campaign and i had enough fun with that but just in terms of the bigger picture of scripts changing from script to screen it's gonna happen with any movie i can't even begin to tell you how many times i've interviewed uh, filmmakers and they've told me it's almost like an adaptation process. It kind of is an adaptation process, taking it from the script the script stage. Then the script changes in production. Then it will change again in the edit yeah. process. So things are not going to stay, even if you have the best screenplay in the world, or at least you think you do right on day one. It's going to change in some respect by the end of the whole process. But I think The Shallows was a blacklist script, too. Yeah. And I, I was just thinking of other blacklist scripts that I was excited for that went on to disappoint me. And I don't know if any of you ever saw this one, but the one that upset me the most was ATM. Did you ever see that horror movie? No. It was from Chris Sparling, the guy who wrote Buried. And I was so excited about it because I love the movie Buried. I've spoken about it on a bunch of these shows. And ATM was a cool idea to me because it was also a movie about about characters being confined in a situation they're confined in in like a, an ATM type building and they can't get out and there's killer out there <laughs> I thought that was like the coolest simplest idea and god is that a garbage movie that is just a Awful, awful that movie. that one sounds like to me is something very difficult to translate it from script a, to screen. It was a blacklist script. But even still, yeah. just like that concept alone, Ugh. it might have read better. Uh, I mean, people do say like the movie is made three times: once mm -hmm. in the script, once in production, then once in editing, and mm. then some people might add a fourth once in marketing. But really, that's just whether or not it's going to perform yeah. well or not. Janae, what do you think? Um, I was gonna. I thought you were gonna say that the ATM was like possessed or something. Like the ATM was. I would have seen that. Maybe, I would have seen that. Maybe that would have like, been the Whoa. better movie. Yeah. Um, or they get sucked into the ATM. I should write a movie. Just kidding. Um, but <laughs> you guys, um, I was gonna say that I read a bunch of like pilots when I was acting, and we read a bunch of pilots and then see the pilots on TV, and uh, a few different times I would be very disappointed by how it turned out mm -hmm. and also I'd be very surprised by how it turned out and one that I remember specifically was don't trust the bitch in apartment 23 oh yeah I read the pilot for that and um thought that it was so much better on screen than the way that it read um and it was extremely similar like they were pulling a lot of dialogue which is something that you don't see um another pilot that I had auditioned for was awkward on MTV was changed a lot from the pilot that I read to the way that it that it showed up on screen and don't trust the bitch in apartment 23 they didn't change a lot but for some reason I enjoyed seeing it so much better than than I did reading it and it made me think that sometimes certain storylines just l work better visually you know it's the same way like you can understand something a little bit better if you see it happen right in front of you and so I do think that some scripts 
look better on screen than they read and vice versa. Yeah. I've Just, never seen that pilot, so I can't say for that specifically, but it's also worth considering the fact that a, a screenplay is generally written by one person, maybe more. Right. Often there are more people, but it's certainly not a film crew size of people working on it. So in that case, I mean, for all I know, uh, Kristen Ritter, right? Yeah. yeah. Maybe it was the fact that she brought that character yeah. to it's life. It's true because she's delivery, way. Exactly. her comedic timing. Exactly. So it's really tough to say, really. I actually really like that show. Me I, too. I, I, wish, I wish it had gone on further. We only got like a season uh, and a half. Well, I mean, the first season and especially the first episode, for someone who generally hates pilots, <laughs> I remember watching that pilot and being like, damn, like I'm glad I gave this a shot because after I read the script, I was like, oh, this is garbage. But maybe it's her. You're right because I do love her so much. <laughs> So much. Hey, even James Vanderbeek was a uh, played himself yes, in, in that and show. And it was excellent. And he was hilarious. Hilarious. Yeah. yeah. All right, what's next? Amna writes, Hala from Dubai. What do you think about all these rumors about Joker's appearance in Justice League? Do you think that the studio has heard fans please about more Joker? Thanks in Joker voice. Bye bye. Well, I mean, a couple months ago, I guess there was uh, rumors of Jared Leto being in London where they're shooting Justice League. So people assume that maybe that he has a cameo as Joker in that movie. If he is, I I'm guessing it's probably going to be a small role, maybe a cameo. You can't make Joker the big bad guy. Like, you can't have a guy who basically has no powers whatsoever. Right. The big bad guy that, that Batman, Wonder Woman... Uh, Cyborg, Flash, Aquaman, and then uh, potentially Superman coming back. Defeat. Yeah, like, oh man, I can't. <laughs> we can't beat the Joker. So, in, in in that regards, yeah, he can't be the big bad guy. But uh, you know, it's I don't think it's out of the realm of possibilities of him either making a cameo that sets up a Batman solo film, or maybe he is part of the the storyline. I I know uh, I was talking to John, and he he mentioned uh, a storyline of Injustice: Gods Among Us, the the comic book that involved joker having a, a a story uh like importance to the story in that even though he wasn't the main bad guy so hmm. i don't know perry what do you think i'm thinking it's very likely especially given the uh cameos that were incorporated into suicide squad it seems like that's just the mindset dc has and you know perhaps it's a smart idea just putting as many characters as you can having them pop up just to create that interconnectivity between films I, I do hope it is a very small cameo type appearance though because one of my biggest gripes with Suicide Squad is I almost think that uh, they should have just made a Harley Quinn Joker movie because if those characters were being put on screen in the way that they were, that storyline and that relationship deserved at least 90 minutes all to itself. So if we do get them in Justice League, an itty bitty fleeting glance, please. Just I want to know that he is active in some respect in the whole DCEU and just leave it at that. And God, give them their own movie. Yeah, I think uh, there is a Harley Quinn movie that they're yeah. going to make. Uh -huh. The speculation is whether or not or how big a role mm -hmm. Joker is going to have in it. But seeing as how well they were received in Suicide Squad, that kind of Bonnie and Clyde thing, Sid and Nancy thing, I think. I think that will definitely happen. Sinead, what do you think? Um, well, I agree. I think they do deserve their own movie. I also really liked The Joker in Suicide Squad, and I feel like I would be sad if he wasn't in it now that I've seen it. Um, and I think because I liked him so much in Suicide Squad, like I really enjoyed it, and a lot of people are like, what? But I really did. I would be really happy to see him in Justice League. Um, I, I don't know. I don't understand how anyone can hate The Joker in Suicide Squad. Like, I... I like it was my biggest thing that I could not understand for someone who's not that opinionated on these things. I loved the Joker in Suicide Squad. So I, I want to see him as much as possible. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with people being attached to the Heath Ledger Joker. Well, who I, I, I love. Yeah. Don't get me wrong. Love well, it. You know, some people have the mindset you can't love two things, you know? Well, you can actually, only, you can only I liked, love one. There, this was different. No, choose, Sinead. No, no way. Sinead. There is no one. way. There's there is a Heath Ledger no, Joker like in like my both. heart, <laughs> no. and now there is a Jared Look, Leto is Joker in my works. heart. You can only like one Guys, thing. Dennis is just Marvel, really hungry right now. Marvel <laughs> or DC. Can't like both. You only no, pick I one. like no, them no. both, you guys. I'm Heath really Ledger sorry. or Jared Leto's Joker. Also no. I like them both. No. <laughs> Sprinkled, powdered, no. frosted. I like a lot of things. And I think that everyone would benefit from watching Suicide Squad again and watching the Joker and judging him with a fresh, a fresh mind. Yeah. 
Love Heath Ledger. But Jared Leto's good, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, let's move on to the next one. Matthew writes, hey, Collider Crew. After nine years of being on home video, I finally got around to watching Sunshine again since its theatrical run back in 2007. Even though I'd only seen it once before, many images from the film have stuck with me, like the shot of Cill Cillian Murphy dreaming of falling into the sun or Michelle, say that for Yo. me? Yo. And the lone sprout towards the end. I don't know. It just worked for me. Anyways, my point is that Danny Boyle is a quality filmmaker. His filmography really is fantastic. What do y'all think is your favorite Danny Boyle film or his best? Train Spotting, 28 Days Later, Slumdog Millionaire, Sunshine, and 127 Hours are all good options. Thanks for all the great work you do. Uh, Sunshine is actually one of my favorite sci fi movies ever. I would have to say that might be my favorite one. I mean, I love, you know, most recently, Steve, I thought he did a wonderful job with Steve Jobs, mm -hmm. which I think went kind of under the radar and underrated because of kind of like the liber I guess liberties that he took with, with the, the story. Um, 127 Hours, Great Slumdog. I, I, Danny Boyle is a fantastic filmmaker. I actually saw his first film, Shallow Grave, in the theater <laughs> because it had so much buzz at that time. No one knew who Danny Boyle was, but that, and no one knew who uh, Ewan McGregor was or Chris Eccleston either. Uh, but they were touting it as kind of like a Hitchcockian like uh, thriller. Uh, what, what do you think, Perry? I definitely think he's one of the best filmmakers out there. And that's even coming from someone who strongly disliked Steve Jobs. Oh, really? I actually think it was, I think I had such a big reaction to it because I took it very personally. Not that I didn't know about, you know, what Steve Jobs was said to be like in real life, but as a hardcore Apple fan, like phone, I mean, Apple is so part of my life. That movie, the way it was done, almost made me feel like it was Steve Jobs just like yelling at me the entire time, and it was kind of upsetting to me. A I lot of people said that. A lot of people said, I don't like Steve Jobs anymore. Yeah, it, something about it just rubbed me the wrong way, and I think maybe if it was formatted a little differently. Maybe because the truth was being put into well, your eyes which and ears. Is, which is a fair point that I'm aware of, but I think that that almost would have been an interesting movie had the whole story been told from uh, Kate Winslet's perspective, or I might have liked it more in that way. But I think the Danny Boyle movie I probably watched the most is, surprise, surprise, 28 Days Later. Yeah. I, lo I love that movie, and I could watch it nonstop. But the one I want to shout out is The Beach. Oh. Why aren't we talking about The Beach? I love that. I never oh my saw God. it. The only thing I can remember is laughing during the trailer because they played it before a bunch of movies, and it, it had basically... Leonardo DiCaprio with a headband on. Uh -huh. He's at the beach and he's doing this. So, <laughs> I just remember laughing oh, I, so I had hard. such a crush on him uh, in too. that movie. Me I too. watched The Beach like, in the 90s so uh -huh. many. It, when did that come out? It was late right 90s? around. I, I, late 90s? I think, I think it might have been very late. It was like right after Titanic, I think, right? No. No. Either right before or right 2000. after. 2000. I knew, I, knew yeah. I was a little older when I was watching yeah. that. But I'm a, when that movie came out and I had to own it, mm -hmm. I must have watched it yeah, over too, and actually. over and over again. Uh, just because of Leonardo DiCaprio's yeah. obsessed. I may have I to watch it just today. because Danny Boyle directed <laughs> yeah. it. Yeah. Um, real quick. Is Sunshine the one... Um, I haven't... I feel like I've seen this movie, but... Are they? They're on the spaceship, right? Yeah, and they're heading basically to save the world. Right. I don't know why I thought it was called something else, but yeah. I just Chris Evans it. is in yes. it actually. Yes. Uh, and yeah. Cliff Curtis. Yeah, yeah, yeah. A bunch of uh, yeah. good actors in there. It's actually, it's funny because it's like it's kind of a simple plot, but at the same time, I, I, I find it much deeper than than just a simple storyline. Mm -hmm. I haven't watched it in a while, but I do know I liked it I just it when watched I did. it. There is, I, like, I mean, I, my only it. complaint is at the end, and this is everyone's complaint, yeah, yeah. The, the, the change Very in, in, in what happens at the end. You could have just, luckily I was warned before I saw it, so uh -huh. it didn't catch me by surprise, but if I had seen that without knowing mm -hmm. that, I'd be like, what is going on here? All right, what's next? Adam Wright, take lighter. Why? My question is, why is it that the picture and sound quality of a film is impeccable in cinema screens, but yet once the film comes out on DVD, the quality seems to have deteriorated? Do studios make a cinema copy of the film in HD and then a lesser quality cut for DVD releases? Furthermore, do they make a better quality cut for Blu-rays? Seems strange that a studio would create three copies of a film at different qualities. If so, why is this the case? Would love to know your thoughts. Perry? Well, I think it's... Uh a question depending on how you've also seen the movies because I I've often gone to the theater 
and it's just been a crappy quality theater and then I go home and I'll watch a blu-ray and it's beautiful but then again if I go into the the prime and I see something there and then I see it at home it might be different it's also a matter of your home entertainment system you know if you have a big beautiful tv you're going to get a great picture there if you're watching a blu-ray versus a dvd you're probably going to notice the difference I mean what's the difference between a dvd and blu-ray is it like is it one sixth the size where yeah, it's pretty small i know uh dvds are probably what 720 by 480 and then you have blu-rays are 1920 by yeah. 1080 but it's something like picture it you know if you watch a dvd and it's this big and then if you expand it like that's the size of the blu-ray so yeah. you're going to notice the quality difference there it's also a matter of how your home entertainment system is set up in your house depending on where you're sitting and then there's there's sound so I don't think there's a, a situation where a studio is like, let's deliver a crappy quality here and a better quality here. So uh, like a money making scheme or anything like that. It's specifically the issue of, you know, how good is your TV? How good is your sound? Are you watching on Blu-ray? Are you watching on DVD? And then for people who don't like the quality in the theater versus your home, then it's a matter of where are you seeing it? How is it projected? What kind of sound system are you working with? So all of those play factors. Yeah, it's a combination of the delivery system, which is like, let's say, uh, your TV or a projection system, and then the quality of the actual file that they're playing. You're talking about like, okay, DVD is, you know, this size compared to 1920 by 1080 Blu-ray, but then 1920 by 1080 Blu-ray is only this big compared to, let's say, a 4K mm -hmm. projection screen. So it's not that, that movie studios, they, they would want you to see the best quality at your home, but your delivery system is not the same. So, for example, a DVD, I can't remember the exact number, but let's say a DVD holds like 700, I think 700 megs worth of <laughs> of of information so you can only fit that amount and then a blu-ray holds i think about maybe 32 gigs or something like that actually i'm wrong no dvd is four point something 4.7 gigs oh you're right and uh, uh a blu-ray is like 32 gigs so it can hold more information that's why you're having a higher quality so the one that you're talking about like how great it is to see in the theater that's they're not playing a blu-ray they're playing things that are like a, a movie is probably like 800 900 gigs big you know and you can't fit that on something what it, which is considered a, a consumer product so in the future they'll they'll make things better and, and, and delivery systems will be better but that's why it's not like the studios actually may want to make lesser quality stuff it's they can't deliver it to you in in what you see at the theater i mean a, a high-end system at the theater is always going to be the best way to watch a movie. You, you know? spoiled me with the Prime. I know. I've AMC should be paying me money for how many people I've, you I've seriously converted. talk about the Prime yeah. as if it's like the best thing since be sliced bread. It, yeah, because it is. It really is, though. <laughs> I mean, and the first thing I had seen in there was the Jungle Book, which is a particular movie that is just so well suited to be seen in the best possible with the best possible visual possible. <laughs> oh, I'm trying to learn uh, it's Mark Riley right now. It's the hunger setting it. seriously no i have my coffee i'm okay for now um but it that's the kind of movie where you're going to get the best experience if you have the best possible mm -hmm. visual mm -hmm. and audio quality yeah. so that's like the prime to me is a is a theater that you know envelops you and surrounds you with the movie and really puts you in more so than any 3d i've seen yeah, yeah and you can't compare it to like if you're at home and you have your tv and you don't you don't even have a sound system it's like just a little tiny speakers on your tv it's like of of course you're not going to hear this awesome sound it's not it's not yeah it's not the movie's fault it's right. a, you got the wrong well not everyone's wrong like i didn't understand what they were saying in mad max fury road well dennis told me to go watch it in prime and i heard every word <laughs> yes every word <laughs> I'm all right kidding. totally kidding all Come right on. play too hype from chicago right Kleiner squad been a fan of you all for a very long time and have picked up a lot of nuggets about your guys's life dennis and perry once wanted to direct to direct films Perry directed a horror. Christian worked at a studio and used to do stand-up. Mark still does. Schnapp still directs awesome indie films. The death of Superman lives what happened. My question is, what made you all, besides Schnapp, kind of stop wanting to create films and do this instead? And would you ever pursue that passion again? I absolutely love what you all do, but let's be serious. Who wouldn't want to see a crime drama directed by Dennis or a horror film <laughs> by Perry or Harloff do stand-up again, LOL. Thank you for answering my question. Well, thanks for that question. 
never stopped. I mean, that's the thing is like when you have that, it's not that I sat around like, oh, I'm not going to do that anymore. It's a question of a balance in your life in terms of your time and your energy. I would love to, to spend uh, a lot of time working on my own projects. I mean, before before I took over in February for Collider Video, I was actually spending my free time writing and, and directing and editing sketch videos uh, with, with Adam over there when we had plenty of time. Uh, so it's nothing that ever stopped or ever will stop. I will always want to write and direct and edit in my own projects. It's just all about timing and I'm, I'm hopeful maybe either towards the end of this year or early next year when things are more settled here because we've been expanding like crazy, right? We've been adding so many shows. Like, I, I don't, don't know, know how, what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, how many shows do we add since I since I took over? Like Jeez. Nightmares, TV Talk, now we have Best news. of the Week, Collider News, Top 10 Show. Five? We've added so much here. Um, so I think that is starting to slow down now and hopefully my life can get back to a regular schedule. Uh, Perry, what about you? Uh, first, just to correct, I did not direct the horror film. I produced it. Yeah. And directing gave me such anxiety in film school. That program was one of the best things I ever did. So actually, to backtrack a little, because it will go to my actual answer to this question. So when I first got out of college, I jumped right into, you know, not necessarily film criticism, but the film reporting world. And eventually I earned my place and I was able to start critiquing films. Then I hit the point where, not, not that it's wrong and, and not that every critic out there should have movie making experience, but for me personally, something started to feel really wrong about criticizing other people's work without knowing what it felt to do it myself. So that's when I went to film school as in, in a graduate program. And while I was there, I purposely picked this program because I love this part of it. The first year, the second year, you ultimately graduate with a concentration, and it's either directing, screenwriting, or, or producing. The first year of that program, you have to do all three. Mm -hmm. So it's really cool because then when you end up having to work with your peers who are on other tracks later in the program, everyone has a clear understanding of what it takes to get that specific job done. And I think it really did create an environment where we all work together really, really well. So directing those shorts that were required of me my first year, I just really wanted to like crawl in a hole and die. I felt so inferior to everybody because I had never directed anything and just stre it stressed me out to no end. But I, I did make a couple shorts that I was proud of, but ultimately I wanted to produce because I am incredibly detail oriented. I love checking off my to-do list and making stuff happen for the people out there who are more talented than I am. So this the movie that I produced it's ac actually if you go on my Instagram right now we just unveiled the first uh, the poster for it it's mm. called Child Eater Aww. surprise surprise yeah. I, why was your answer well, your reply because off? you said you just unveiled the poster of it. So I was more thinking like <laughs> that's so sweet I, I was versus the actual thinking, name of it was yeah, just I wasn't very thinking well like times. the child eater part I was just thinking like <laughs> this is a big step for you child eating or no child eating I can guarantee you. you you won't say ah when you look at that poster but I'm very proud of it but uh <laughs> After producing that movie, it, it was pretty much just a matter of uh, like uh, time and money because making a movie and especially producing a movie, I mean, it really just sucks everything out of you. I had, a, I had a pick up for that movie and just leave my entire life for a month. I went upstate and just cut everything off for a month, which is a very scary thing to do when you have a life. But after that... I, I, I don't want to say that I don't want to produce I because I want to make another movie. But at the same time, I would never want to just produce movies and not do this kind of work. I love them both so much. So I hope to have both of them in my life at all times. But I think at this moment, I might get more joy out of celebrating other people's incredible creations than I do out of trying like killing myself to make something on my own. But then again, making Child Eater was probably one of the best experiences that I ever had, and I wouldn't trade that for anything in the world. Yeah. So you guys heard it here first. Perry will be producing my movie that I'm directing, starring Sinead. Aww. I'm open to this idea. Yes. That would be Sinead, dope. what about you? <laughs> you have other pursuits outside of just hosting. Yeah, well, when I first moved uh, to California, it was to sing. Um, which a lot of people don't know about because that's I never talk about it. Um, I did American Idol when I was 16. Don't look it up. And I did The X Factor when I was 18. Also, don't look it up. Um, but I used to want to be a singer so bad. It 
literally drove me to a point of craziness. Um, and there was one thing I couldn't stand was that people telling me how to sing because singing was something that just always came very naturally to me it's not it wasn't something that I had to work really hard at and then when I, I had to change it and kind of like match this image it was really hard for me to deal with and I just decided that singing is something I'll always love and I don't want to put it up for people to criticize and um that's always like something that I love but I'll never go back to ever again and it's just something that has come like clear to me uh, through my journey but acting was something that I always thought I was going to do forever I never ever thought that I was going to host um, but basically my sister who manages like half of the collider crew here um, me Christian Mark Tiffany um, she Jason Inman she was like you gotta do this like everyone's doing this like it's so fun it's so cool hosting's awesome just do it just try it you're loud you never shut up you'll be great at <laughs> you're it you're loud you never shut yeah, up yeah and I was like all right well cool I'll do it and there's been kind of like no turning back but I always wanted to go back to scripted and um like just starting up at it again this year and like getting all my headshots and stuff back but I don't know man it's like so tough because we live in a city where there's opportunities everywhere and like if a good project just came to you and I'm sure you'd want to pursue it same with you as well if someone was like I have this awesome movie like we need a producer like I saw what you did with child eater <laughs> it was <laughs> rad um but like you just you never know it could happen tomorrow or the next day or but that's the cool thing so I mean I don't know right now it's like business always changes but it's it's a good it's a good thing right because yeah. we're always exposed to different opportunities yeah all right guys that's it for this episode of collider mailbag i want to thank the people join us here at the table uh Sinead, where can people find you online at Sinead defries and at that so Sinead.com on mondays hosting collider tv talk on fridays hosting movie talk and hosting mailbag over the weekend and Perry. The last question made me so happy. I like that. Yeah. Uh, you can catch me on Twitter and Instagram at PNMROF. Collider Nightmares every Tuesday and best of the week right after Mailbag every Saturday. And you can find me on Twitter at Think Hero or Instagram Dennis.TZNG. I'll be on Movie Talks Mondays and Fridays and then the Saturday Mailbag. I want to thank uh, Cody and Adam back there uh, helping us out on this show. And we will see you guys next time. Hey guys, if you like this video, click the thumbs up button. Also, make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel. It'll help you stay up to date with everything we've got going on here at Collider.